الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين My brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So last week we were talking about the do's and don'ts of powerful speaker or powerful speaking. So today we will be speaking about the do's. <coughs> Depends how do you write it with one O or two. So there are certain, till last week we were talking about the don'ts. The do's. Are you sure? Yes, yes. The do's. Yes. The do's. You're right. So, yes, you, you're very right. So, today, we will continue in that. We have two more or three more do's. So, the first one, and please p uh, pay close attention. <coughs> B persuasive what do we mean by be persuasive so sometime I tell you something for example as an orator as a speaker as a preacher I will say you know what guys ghiba backbiting is haram which is true it is haram in Islam to backbite I can say just like that or I can be persuasive. I can offer the moral ground for why it is not good to backbite. And that will be more persuading to you and to your audience, speaking to the audience. So, and instead of just saying backbiting is backbiting is haram I can say the following in order to make my point to convince and persuade my audience with my point I say to them put yourself in the other guy's shoes put yourself in the other guy that you gossiped against So, if you were to tell me someone gossiped against me, someone said something bad about me, how do I feel? It feels terrible. Since I don't want anybody to talk about me, to gossip against me, to backbite against me, because it feels terrible, just imagine if I come to you and tell you so and so was basically attacking you yesterday somewhere, how do you feel? It feels really terrible. You will be fuming most likely. You will be extremely upset. <coughs> Put yourself in the shoes of the other guy that you gossiped against. If it feels bad to you, it must be feel, it must feel bad to him as well or another example don't che cheat don't cheat when you sell something or buy something don't cheat don't commit fraud that's the simple way to say it but in order to be more convincing is to tell your audience that imagine if you were cheated on you went you purchase something believing it is, let's say, worth 500 and you paid 500 but then you find out it's only worth $10, $10. Bucks. How do you feel? You feel terrible. Since you don't want to feel that way and you hate to feel that way, don't do it to others. Don't cheat. This way you make it more reasonable, logical, persuasive to your audience 
when you just tell them backbiting is haram, period, or cheating is haram, period. In fact, you're trying to persuade. So it's not only a something haram, period, and I have to listen to, which is the case, in fact. You know, I'm not, I'm not in a place where I argue with God. God is my Lord. He is my creator. As a Muslim, as a Muslim, I feel I am obligated to listen to him no matter what. Just like a doctor telling you something and you trust that doctor. You fully trust his knowledge and his honesty. You're not going to argue with your doctor if he tells you something. You just listen to your doctor. So I really don't need to be persuaded in my heart. But obviously it is better to, to persuade your audience. You will get better results. In fact, you will be winning their heart and their mind. Or another example, when we talk about hijab, I can say hijab is wajib, period. But instead of just saying hijab is period, let me convince my audience that hijab is better for you. It is for your protection. In this country, in the West, the most exploited thing in the West is women. Though the West speaks about Though the West speaks about women liberation and emancipation, but in fact, women are the most exploited individual in the West. The industry, the porn industry, yields over $7 billion in the United States. And guess who is the victim? Who is the one who is being exploited in the porn industry? It's women. So, if you put it in that context that hijab came not to restrict you rather to honor you rather to protect you so it will be more convincing than just to say you know what just listen Allah said it's wajib and it's wajib so if I'm someone who fear God most likely I will listen but without any conviction in my heart persuade me persuade me Convince me with your point. Don't just tell me that's how it is. I may take it for the merit of being, you know, God-fearing person. But you need also to take a further step by convincing me with what you're telling me. So be persuasive. Number two, be <clears throat> respectful. What do we mean by being respectful? Be respectful, meaning when I talk to a group of audience, there are women, there are men. There are Muslims, there are non-Muslims. There are Shia, there are Sunnis. There are atheists maybe, who knows? When I talk to any audience, I have to keep in mind that I have to respect them all. Not only the man versus woman, not only Muslims versus. So in Arabic, I have noticed this among so many Arabic speaking individuals. The minute he stands on the podium, what does he say? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, assalamu alaykum ayyuha al-ikhwa wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaykum my dear brothers wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What about the sisters? They hardly acknowledge sisters. They hardly acknowledge sisters. That is disrespect. I consider that to be a disrespect. In fact, in fact, I have seen some progressive Muslims who when speak to an audience of mixed women and men, they say, Assalamu alaikum, my sisters and my brothers. They address men, women before men. That's showing the Prophet says, مَا أَهَانَ الْمَرْأَةَ مَا, ما أَكْرَمَ الْمَرْأَةَ إِلَّا كَرِيمٌ وَمَا أَهَانَهَا إِلَّا لَئِيمٌ He says, only honorable men respect women. Only honorable men. And only wicked men disrespect women. So, as to be respectful to my audience, 
if they are mixed, men and women, I always need to say brothers and sisters or sisters and brothers. Not only single men, brothers. That's one example. The other example, if I'm talking to a group of Muslims and non-Muslims, I need to be also respectful in the sense that when I mention Islam, I in include other religions as well. Be more inclusive. When I mention in the beginning, I praise Allah and, Prof and, and, and Prophet Muhammad, let me praise all the Prophets of Allah. I have seen some well-known speakers after saying Alhamdulillah wa salatu ala Rasulullah wa ala alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin wa ala jami'i anbiya Allah wal mursaleen. He praises Allah and he praises and glorifies the Prophet and his family and all the messengers of Allah. So this way I'm more inclusive, I'm more respectful toward my... Uh, in fact, there is a story, a real story, uh, that a true story that I was a witness. So I heard this story first from someone, or actually I read it somewhere, but then I verified the story with the person who happened, the story happened with him. So in Iraq, in Iraq, there are Christians, there are Muslims, there are a few Jews, and there are Yazidis. Have you heard of the Yazidis? Lately you have heard of them, I'm, I'm sure, after ISIS took over, yes, Yazidis. I'm sorry? I know about them. You know about them? Not 100% familiar. Yeah. So, what, what do Yazidis believe? We don't know exactly. What the, because they, they tend to be secretive about their, uh, their belief system. But what is known is that they glorify the devil. Now, do they worship devil? Some people say they worship devil. No, they don't worship devil. They glorify devil. And you know there is big difference between worshiping something and glorifying. Do we worship our imams or we glorify our imams? We glorify them. If someone says you're a Shia, you worship the imams, that's an insult, right? Same thing with the Hindus. I hear some people say Hindus worship the cow. They don't worship the cow. They revere the cow. And there is a big difference. Whether I agree with them on revering the cow or not, but there is a big difference. I have to, and this is something I need to also mention in the next point, being objective. So, being, uh, they, I heard they revere the, the devil. And listen to this, it's very funny. On the logic, rationale they use in glorifying the devil. They say God is good and he's all good. Whether you worship him or you're not, you're not going to worship him, he's very good. He's very easy to please. The minute you say, Astaghfirullah, you seek forgiveness, he will forgive you. Allah is so nice that you really don't need to fear in the day of judgment. He is so merciful, so compassionate, that the minute you tell him, I am sorry, he will forgive you. But you need to fear the devil. So in order to stay away from him and to neutralize him, what do we do? We revere him, we worship him, so as to keep him neutralized. Now, that's their logic. Is this the same Yazid in Ibn Muawiyah? No. They, I heard, again, that the reason they say Yazid is because, yes, some, some of them, they revere Yazid as well. But these Yazidis? Yes, oh. yes. But again, you cannot quote me on that. What I know for sure, they revere the devil. Now, if you see a Yazidi and you curse the shaitan, they will be offended. So I heard this story and I verified it by the prime minister of Iraq. I saw him afterward and he said, yes, that's true. So what is the story? The former prime minister of Iraq, Al-Jafari, he said, one day I went to the parliament to give my speech, knowing there are Christians, you know, uh, Sunnis, Kurds. I was very, very careful not to offend anybody. He says, the minute I got to the podium, I opened my mouth, I said, before I say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, what do we say Muslims? 
A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim. Someone raises his hand. Hey, 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 hey. I'm objecting. I said, what? You're objecting to it. I have not even started my speech. What did I say that you got offended? He says, you said, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan. I love the shaytan. You seek refuge to Allah from the shaytan. I love the shaytan. You offended me. The point is, you may not realize it. But the minute you say something, you have not even started your speech, you may have already offended someone. Well, I'm not saying now, don't say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. What I'm trying to say is, when you are speaking only to Shia people, to Muslims, it's okay to say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. But if I'm speaking to a diverse group of people, some of which could be Yazidis who revere the Shaitan, I'm not supposed to offend them if I want to be respectful. So, always be respectful and don't sound demeaning to any person. Any person. I hear some people, Muslim speakers, when they talk about other faith, they get so disrespectful and demeaning. Don't. See the Quran, the manners of Quran, is that when Allah speaks to the infidels, to the non-Muslims, to the non-believers, what does, does Allah say? وَأَنَا أَوْ إِيَّاكُمْ لَعَلَى هُدًا أَوْ فِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ Either me or you may be on the wrong path. Well, did the Prophet doubt that he was on the right path? So why he says either me or you could be on the wrong path? Out of respect. Out of respect. Because when you talk to certain people, if you want to be influencing them and convince them, win their heart and then win their support, do not let them view you as an enemy. Rather, either friend or at least neutral. Not someone who is so demeaning. If someone comes to you now and he starts blasting the Prophet, and then he says, you know what? I want to teach you about Christianity. What your reaction will be? Your reaction will be go to hell. You want to tell me about Christianity? Learn how to talk to people. Be respectful. Is that how Jesus taught you? I'm not going to even listen to his message. I will close my eyes. I will block my, eye, my ears. Why? Because when he started by attacking me, attacking my religion, I decided he is biased and I'm not going to listen to him. I may listen to him if he showed some understanding and openness and respect for my faith. Same thing when it comes to our Sunni brothers. Some people think that we do Shias could have thought a big favor when I go harsh against Omar and Abu Bakr and those were corrupt people, those who usurped power. Don't say these things. What I would do, I just tell the truth. Assalamu alaikum. I tell my audience what happened in history, in course of history, quoting Sunni books. In order for me to promote my Shia faith, I don't need to be demeaning to others. All I need to do is to talk about the akhlaq of Ahlul Bayt. You know, there is a phrase you always hear. You don't want to be, you can be pro-Shia, but you don't want to be anti-Sunni. You can be pro-Islam, but you don't have to be anti-Christian. Being pro-Islam doesn't mean you, you have to be anti-Christianity. Meaning you can talk with so much passion about your religion, but yet always respect the others. Always. 99% of people who did not choose the right path, and what I mean by the right path, the right path you and I would recognize as a right path, 99% of them who didn't follow the, the, the uh, who did not follow the right path, they did not choose to. They were born into that. There are two billion Christians around the world. How many of them chose to be Christian? How many? The vast majority of Christians were born into Christianity. It was chosen for them by their family. Same thing goes to Muslims. How many Muslims chose their faith? Very few. 
you got a few people who converted to Islam, right? The vast majority of Muslims are Muslims because they were born into Islam. I was born in a Muslim family. My father is Ali. My fa mother is Fatima. I became Hassan. I became Muslim. Someone else was born in a Christian family. He found himself a Christian. To be demeaning is not fair at all. Respect people's faith. I may disagree with your faith, but I don't want to be disrespectful to your faith. I shouldn't be disrespectful. Respect people's faith. Respect people's school of thought. Respect your audience in order to influence your audience and make them accept and embrace your, your point of view. You have to show respect to them. Showing respect doesn't mean you agree with them. No, you, that doesn't mean you agree with them. You just showing respect. In one of my speeches, apparently, when I referred to Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, I said, As Sayyida Aisha. I was speaking in Arabic. As Sayyida Aisha. Sayyida in Arabic, the lady. So usually you show, you know, respect. So on one trip, I was in Qom and I was visiting the shrine of uh, Sayyida Ma'suma. A sheikh saw me. I don't know him. All of a sudden, out of the blue, he showed up and he said, you're Qazwini? I said, yes. He says, I'm so disappointed at you. I said, why? He says, I was listening to your lecture the other day. And uh, he says, you said Sayyida Aisha. I said, so what I'm supposed to say? I, am I supposed to say Sayyid Aisha instead of Sayyida, Sayyid Aisha? He says, no, just say Aisha. I said, but would it be a big deal if I say Sayyida? He says, yeah, you're showing respect to this lady who does not deserve respect. I said, look, she may, that, she may not deserve respect, but my audience deserve respect. I'm talking to a group of Sunni and Shia, and I have to be very sensitive to the way my audience feel. And because they revere Aisha, I have to be respectful to them. I'm not complimenting Aisha. I'm not glorifying her. All I'm saying is I'm saying, Lady Aisha, what's the big deal about that? So, my point is always be respectful toward your audience. Don't be so demeaning. I have witnessed some people, Muslims, who go to churches, synagogues. I have seen them by my own eyes and listened to them by my own ears. They, talk, they think they are doing a a great service to Islam. When they talk about Islam to a non-Muslim, you know, Islam is the best religion. Islam is the superior religion. That might be true, but that's not the way you say it. In order to convince a Christian or a Jew to convert to Islam is not by telling him Islam is superior to your religion. Rather, by telling him Islam is what? Is similar to your religion. When I say to a Jewish, Islam is superior to your religion, I'm making the gap between him and Islam so big that he cannot cross. But when I tell him there are many similarities between Islam and, and Judaism, in fact, I'm making the gap so small that if he wanted to join, he will not feel it so difficult to join, right? When I tell a Jew, you know what? When you become Muslim, you're already a Jew. When I tell a Christian, if you choose to be a Muslim, you're already Christian. Because in my religion, in order to be a Muslim, you have to recognize Christianity and Judaism. You have nothing to lose. You just add up to what you have, what already, what you have already gained. Rather than sounding, your religion is all trash. Come and learn from us. Your religious, uh, religion is muharraf, it's distorted. That's not how you attract your audience to be, to even coming close to Islam, not, not alone embracing Islam. When you choose your word, be careful. One time, I, instead of saying Buddhist, Buddhist, right? Buddhist, Buddhist right? I said another word that was not so accurate. So someone came and said, say, don't say that word. It's offensive, even though I did not mean it. Make sure when you, same thing with when it comes to me. 
when someone mentions the name of Prophet Muhammad in a wrong way, or the name of Islam in a wrong way, or Ramadan, he calls it Ramadan. You know, one time, a journalist, a reporter in Detroit News, he says, you know, I remember during uh, the war in Afghanistan against Taliban, it happened during the month of Ramadan. Some people were objecting that, let's wait for Ramadan to be over, those Muslims revere Ramadan. So let's wait till after Ramadan and then we resume the, uh, the air missiles. Uh, Bush decided to go on and uh, to, to launch the war anyway. So there was a controversy in America among Americans. This journalist was telling me, he's American, he says one American confused guy sent me a letter saying why those people are fighting over bombarding Afghanistan in, uh, in Ramadan. What does it have to do with Ramadan? Apparently he read Ramadan as Ramadan. And he was confused that America is about to bomb Ramadan Hotel. And he was so confused why America want to, why, want to bomb all Ramada Inn hotels in Afghanistan. So I told him there is no Ramada Inn in, in Afghanistan. And it is not Ramada Inn, it's Ramadan. So when you, for example, when you talk to Christian and you need to mention their religion, be careful. Jesus alayhi salam, always say alayhi salam because we do believe he is a great messenger of God. And uh, when you mention his, his uh, mother, it would be nice that you say Lady Maryam alayhi salam. So always be careful. When you talk to non-Muslims and when you talk to their respective religion or when you address the pastor, make sure you call him pastor and not pastor, as some Arabic people who have difficulty pronouncing the... I have seen it myself. We were somewhere in an interfaith and there was a Palestinian guy and he, every few minutes, bastard, bastard. I said, please don't say that because this is not good. So, or like Pakistan. Or uh, uh, when, uh, for example, uh, the parking, they call it barking. So, uh, but that's not very offensive, parking. But if you call the pastor with B, it will be a really problem. So, be respectful. I'm trying to... Look up at a note I had, I don't know, maybe I had mistakenly deleted that note. So, okay. Number three. Be cool. Sometimes speakers get too excited. And then they get riled up. And then they start yelling and screaming. Sometimes you have to raise your voice. But, and you be passionate. But raising your voice and being passionate doesn't mean you, you know, get angry. And get riled up. There are two different things. You have to always maintain your dignity and your respect among people. Always be cool. Don't, due to the excitement the topic is creating in you, sometime you go offline. Don't do that. Don't always scream. There is a speaker here in Dearborn, I'm not going to say who. Trust me, when he speaks, I just want to run away because of the the noise, unbearable noise he causes when he talks. And he always rebukes people. He makes people feel guilty. Don't do that. Don't let your people, your audience feel guilty. That's not good. You are not a good community. The reason God had uh, inflicted you with uh, 
you know, let's say with this virus is because you are all sinners. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish sinners. And look at those people at Las Vegas. They kept on sinning and sinning and sinning till Mr. Pada came and he killed them all. This is not the way you talk. This is not the way you manifest God's rahmah and mercy by making your, your audience feel guilty, by uh, rebuking them, by making them sometime unworthy. You guys, you Muslims, you know, the reason Jews are, are much more sophisticated than us, because we are a bunch of dumb people. We are very backward people. You don't need to say these things. You need to give, boost their morale. Even if you want to talk about their flaws, you have to, you have to wrap it up in a pleasant way, in diplomatic way. Just the story, remember the story of the king and his dream? If you want to even rebuke and censure your audience, you don't need to do it in a very conspicuous way. You have to do it in a nice way. And instead of saying you, what do you say? We. We, including yourself. And instead of saying you guys always you make mistakes, you say some of us often make mistakes. Some of us. You cannot say all of us because that's not even a true. Some of us may make mistakes. The word choice makes a big difference in accepting your message or rejecting your message by your audience. Trust me, the choice of words. I've seen it myself. Sometime spe a speaker would use a word that he was not supposed to use, even though his intentions were well, and he really didn't mean anything bad, but he lost his audience because of the choice of word he, he chooses. So always, be cool, don't lose your temper, don't yell at people. If you see a child moving from place to a place, I have seen someone, a speaker, God, God help him, God help him. He made the mother melt because of the outburst he caused. He just saw a child moving from one place to another place. Or another speaker I saw, a famous speaker, he saw a man putting, adding one more uh, desk or chair actually for people still coming and he, welt, he went wild on him. You guys do not respect the lecture of Imam Hussein. You have no understanding of how important these lectures are. You don't need to say this. You lose respect. People will not listen to you. And guess what? That was the last time we invited him. Never we invited him anymore. Because of his way, his attitude. It was arrogant, it was demeaning, and he was so riled up. And one other time I saw a man looking at the women's section, and you women, you don't deserve to be here. You should be kicked out because a few kids were making noise. That's a big mistake. A big mistake. Don't be demeaning. Be cool. Number four, so we can move uh, quick, number four, and we, uh, we will be done for now with the do's. Be objective. What do we mean by be ob objective? When I talk about any subject, when I talk about any subject, I need to do, give my due diligence. In the way that when I present any idea, whether I agree with it or I disagree, I have to be fair and present it well. How? For example, when some people believe in God, and there are some people who do not believe in God, atheists, and I am basically telling both points of view, I should agree and understand that there are some atheists who I passionately disagree with, but they have some points. I will disagree with their point, but they have points. Sometimes they make logical points. 
instead of ridiculing them, I need, as a trustworthy speaker, I need to give them due justice and point what they say and explain it. Then I can refute it afterward. Let me give you another example. When we talk about Shia Sunni, Shia Sunnis, okay? So, if you go to any Sunni masjid, try it yourself. When the Imam says, Allahu Akbar, what does he say? After reciting Fatiha, if he's reciting Salat al Maghrib al Asha, have you been to any Sunni masjid? What does he say? Amin. No, before Amin. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. They don't say, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. See it. Try it yourself. So, he says, Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen ar Rahman ar Rahim. But in fact, I found out that they do say Bismillah, but not out loud. Silent. They say it silently. So if I were to go and explain the way Shia do their prayer and Sunnis, I should be honest and say Sunnis, when they do their congregational prayer, they say, say Bismillah, but they say it silently. I've seen some Shia Speakers say, you know what? Unfortunately, Sunnis, when they do their prayer, they omit the most honorable ayah in the Quran, and that is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. But that's not true. By not hearing the Imam saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, that doesn't mean they don't say it. They say it. So you have to be objective and be fair, even with your opponent. Vice versa. One time, I was in Los Angeles, and you know how when, when we Shia finish our Salah, we raise our hand three times and we say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. A Sunni Imam approached me and he says, Shaykh, he doesn't know Sayyid. Shaykh, I have a question for you. I said, Fadl. He said, when you Shia finish your Salah, you say three times, you say, Khan al-Ameen. Khan al-Ameen, Khan al-Ameen. The trustworthy guy betrayed the trust. You repeat, the, you repeat that three times. Jibreel. I said, so what do you mean by it? who's the trust? He says, Jibreel. You say that Jibreel stole the message and he took it from Ali ibn Abi Talib. He was supposed to deliver it to Ali ibn Abi Talib. And Ali ibn Abi Talib was supposed to the, be the prophet. He took it from Ali ibn Abi Talib and he delivered it to Muhammad. So you Shia believe that Jibreel committed a dishonesty. a dishonesty by not delivering the message to Imam Ali. Otherwise, he would have been Prophet Ali. And you said, do you really believe in that? He says, I have heard that from so many people. I said, regardless of what you heard, do you really believe? He says, I don't know. I said, look, a few minutes ago, I prayed before you and with you. And in my salah, I said, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh, out loud. If I believe Ali is the legitimate prophet, not Muhammad, then what is the salah? How do you justify that? What is your common sense? So, unfortunately, you find some speaker, a sheikh, who calls himself a sheikh, an educator, lying and not being objective. Had this sheikh given himself the chance to go and ask any Shia leader or read any Shia book, he will find out that this is not true at all. At all. That Shia will not say Khan al Amin, rather, he says Allahu Akbar three times. Be fair. Even with your enemy, even with your opponent, even with those you disagree, be objective. Say it the way it is. You're about to criticize a Trump, that's fine, but don't lie. Don't make up things that he did not say. Say what he truly said. He said, Islam hates us. Someone was telling me, he said, I hate Islam. I said, no, no. Not I'm defending Trump. Not that I'm defending Trump. He did not say, I hate Islam. He said, Islam hates us. Be objective. When you tell something, say it and tell it the way it is. Don't add your own, you know, uh, flavor on it. 
where when it comes to truth, truth is a very precious thing, whether you like it or not. Pr truth is a very precious thing. Don't mess up with the truth. Even when you quote your enemy, then quote him correctly. Be objective. Even if you are about to explain the ideology of your opponent, be objective and do due diligence. Say it the way they said it, not the way you add. So, let's move on. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, how much time we still have? We have 15 minutes. So, we're done with those do's, don'ts, and do's. And or at least we had enough of them so far. Now, let's talk about, uh, what I ca call it, your knowledge treasury. The knowledge treasury. What do I mean by knowledge treasury? Correct? If not, recite Fatiha for my spelling. <laughs> so, what do I mean by knowledge treasury? As a speaker, inshallah, as an orator, as a Muslim speaker, Islamic speaker, who is about to promote Islam and propagate Islam, if I don't know Islam, if I have not studied Islam, how would I propagate Islam? Does that work? If I pose as a medicine professor and I have not studied medicine, how do I do that? How do I teach medicine when I have not studied medicine? This leads me to say for you who are inshallah planning to become public speakers, Muslim preachers in the future inshallah, you need to have your own Islamic education. You need to build your own knowledge treasury. You need to study Islam. Otherwise, if you do not study Islam, if you don't want to do, if you don't want to maintain a knowledge treasury, how are you going to promote Islam? How are you going to promote, pro propagate Islam to, other, to others? You lack the knowledge about Islam. You yourself don't know much about Islam. So what do you want to propagate? You want to propagate something that you're not so aware of it? That's a big mistake. So, I need to enrich my Islamic knowledge. How do I enrich my Islamic knowledge? There are a few steps. One, study. Not read, study Islam. So, of course, this requires that I take Islamic courses. That's how it is. If I want to be a speaker, I have to specialize in Islam and be a speaker. Now, obviously, to many of you, that's not a possibility for you go, to go and, you know, in uh, a seminary, an Islamic university. It's not a possible. It's difficult for you. Many of you have your own jobs, your own, you know, your own studies, not the Islamic studies, rather your own uh, career studies. So, how do I do that? My simple recommendation is enroll in the seminary here. I'm not trying to promote the seminary. But I honestly believe that if you take classes, those classes are unique. They help you enrich your Islamic, you know, treasury. So, there are, what, eight, seven courses on the biography of the Prophet, on jurisprudence, which is Islamic laws, the fundamentals of Islamic laws, Quran, Quran science, that's how you become, you know, more familiar and educated on your faith. You want to take one class, two classes, three classes, if you can take all of them, it would be the best. But if you can, take as many courses as possible. This will definitely, definitely help you to, you know, enrich your Islamic knowledge. And without any exaggeration, I believe this seminary here, 
is offering Muslims, especially the American-born, the English-speaking people, with a great opportunity. Instead of you travel 8,000 miles away and go to Najaf or Qom, Najaf and Qom itself came to you and you can learn. Naam, Sister Reem. It started just the same time we started this class. So uh, they started in October what? 16th. October 16th, less than a month. So I think it's still, the door is still open for you to join. So that's one way to study, take courses. That's how you enrich your, uh, your uh, you know, you want to be a pharmacist without going to pharmacy school, that doesn't work. You want to be a doctor without going to, you know, medicine school, that doesn't work. You want to be an architect without going to architect school, that doesn't work. You have to study the subject, the subject matter. That's number one. Listen, number two, there are other choices. Read lists of books. There are lists of books that I would recommend you read. What are those books? Now, some of those books are you're familiar with. Quran, obviously. I would tell you, read Quran, study Quran. Now, what is the best Quran to read? <clears throat> the problem is, most translations have done, uh, so far, have not done justice to the Quran. Nor they have been able to convey the true spirit of, of Quran. Not mentioning the, the complication, the very complicated language. The, thou, you know, they take you uh, 5,000 years back. I have not seen any contemporary Qur'an translation. I have not seen any nice contemporary translation that I will say, hands down, this is the best translation. I have not seen. There are some good translations, but most of them are with the flaws, with many flaws. However, there is one I recommend. It is called, it's of course, it's called Qur'an. But uh, the Quran, it looks like this. Let me. It's a black cover with gold. And this is how it reads on the middle. It is called the Holy Quran. And the translation and commentary. Translation and commentary. I advise you not only to read the translation, but the commentary. So it is by Ayatollah Agha Muhammad Puya Yazdi and Mir Ahmed Ali. That is my best recommendation. Yes. Yes. So the commentary is by Ayatollah Ayatollah uh, Ayatollah um, uh, Puya, Puya Yazdi, Puya Yazdi, and the translation is by Mr. Mir Ahmed Ali, Mir Ahmed Ali, and the publisher is Tahrik Tarsil Quran, Tahrik Tarsil Quran, it is in, based in New York, Tahrik Tersil Quran, it's a publishing company based in, in New York. So you can order it online or you can buy it uh, from bookstores, various bookstores. Hopefully, inshallah, soon we will be opening a bookstore here at IIA. I recommend this. I recommend you read the translation and also the commentary. The commentary is great. The commentary is really great. It gives you a great, a great depth of knowledge on the verses you are reading. So, if you were to read the translation, read the translation and the commentary. The translation made by Mir Ahmed Ali, the commentary by Ayatollah Puyayezdi. I recommend this one.
I really recommend this one. So that's one, Quran. Obviously, for a public speaker, it's not enough just to read the Quran, rather also to memorize. When you speak, when you give a speech, you out to quote the Quran, cite verses from the Quran. You don't have to memorize the whole Quran, but at least when you talk about a specific subject, you should be familiar with those verses and memorize them. And the more you memorize from heart, the more credible you look in the eyes of your audience. Because when I read, when I give a speech and I read those verses from heart, basically I'm telling my audience that I am an authority in the Quran because I memorize it. So memorize and read, not only read, memorize as many verses as you can, especially if you are doing a research on a specific subject. Re read those verses and memorize them. So that's number two. Read the list of books. The first one was the Quran. Obviously, you got Nahj al Balagha. Nahj al Balagha has been translated by so many individuals. Some of them are really terrible. A grocer in India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, I don't know, with all due respect to grocers, but that's not his job. He just translated Nahj al Balagha, but there are some good translations. So, Nahj al Balagha is a great book to read, but then you have to get the right translation. So, Nahj al Balagha, the uh, Path of Eloquence by Ali ibn Abi Talib, it's a great book. You need to read. Now, I have a list of books for you, my dear brothers and sisters. This is my list, meaning my recommendation. If you're interested, I would recommend that you read those books, either by buying them, by taking them from the library, your library, or whatever. So let's go through these books. Unfortunately, the only way I can display is by displaying the first page in my iPhone. There is no projector for me to show you. Ammo, you want to put the, the camera here? So it shows, yes, the camera here? Huh? I know, but can you put the camera here so people... Yeah, huh? Can you zoom in? Okay. So this is... You took a shot of it? Okay, so this book called The Study Quran by Sayyid Hussein Nasr, it is, he is, he's a professor at Georgetown University, George Washington University. He is the one who basically supervised this project. Many other scholars helped, but he was the main, you know, main author. It is called The Study of Quran. Basically, he is touching upon different schools of thought and in interpreting the Quran. This is one recommendation. The study of Quran by Dr. Sayyid Hussein Nasr. Another book I, I suggest is Zilat Jesus of Nazareth by Reza Aslan. It's a, it's a book about Christianity and how it transpired. I have, I myself, I have not read it, but someone, a friend of mine read it and he said, this is a very nice read. Who's the writer? The writer is a professor of Iranian origin called Reza Aslan. Also, you need to enrich yourself with some general knowledge on philosophy, on a scientist, a history of scientists. So I recommend those two books, The Great Scientist by John Farenden, John Farenden, The Great, it's sold in uh, Barnes and Nobles. Uh, another book, The Great Philosophers, also published by Barnes and Nobles, by Jeremy Strangroom and James Garvey, or Gravy, Garvey. Uh, in, uh, uh, by, you can find them in, in uh, <coughs> uh, Barnes and Nobles. 
a brief summary of the all, all philosophers uh, and a brief summary of all great scientists. Also, let go, let's go through the list uh, really quick. Uh, I recommend this book, Muhammad, a biography of the prophet by Karen Armstrong. It's a very nice read. She was a nun, then she left her you know, career as a nun and she became a professor. She's British and she wrote this very nice book about Prophet Muhammad. Another book I recommend a read. It's called Covering Islam. How the media and the expert determine how we see the rest of the world by Dr. Edward Said. Edward Said is a pioneer in Orientalism. He is a well-known scholar. He passed away a few years ago and he wrote some of the best books and this is one of them. This helps you talk to non-Muslims on how the media covers and it twists the truth about Islam. Another book, what was the, title for that? the title of the book is Covering Islam by Edward Said. Another book that was translated from Arabic, yes, sister. What was the one about Nabi Muhammad? Uh, it is uh, Muhammad, a biography of the prophet by Karen Armstrong. You're welcome. Uh, there is a book I have read in Arabic. I have not read the translation, even though I'm showing you the translation. But I don't know how the translation is. The origin, the Arabic book, is a great, is more than a great, it's a, it's a suburb book. Trust me, trust me, believe me. If Sunni people, Sunni brothers, read this book that was written by a Sunni scholar himself. His name is Mahmoud Abu Riyah. If Sunni people read this book that was written by a Sunni scholar, the name of the book, Light on the Muhammadan Sunnah. Light on the Muhammadan Sunnah. In Arabic, Adwa ala Sunnah al muhammadi by Mahmoud Abu Riyah and translated by Hassan Najafi. If Sunnis read this book, most of them will convert to Shia. And the astonishing part is the author is a Sunni scholar from Egypt. Hassan, Hassan Najafi. It is called and this was published by Ansarian publication in Iran. Light on the Muhammadan Sunnah. If you can get this book and read it, it's, it's beautiful. Also, a nice read I suggest by Juan Cole, the professor at University, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. It's called Sacred Space and Holy War. Beautiful book explaining how the conflict on Islam is going between extremists one side, on one side and some other superpowers. Sacred, Sacred Space and Holy War by one, call, uh, by one call. Another read, I really advise you to read, and this gives you in-depth knowledge on the history of this country. It is called A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. This is one of the most amazing books I have read, I read. The man is very objective. He does not sugar gate and he tells it as it is. Go and read the history, the bloody history of the United States. Go and find out what did the white man did in order to build America. They imported, according to this book, they imported 15 million slaves from Africa, 15 million slaves, 5 million of which died while being shipped to the United States. 5 million died while being shipped to the United States, only 10 million made it. Go read how they were brought, how they were stolen and basically looted from their land and brought to this country. Go and read in this book what Mr. I consider the biggest terror of, uh, terrorist of history, 
the biggest terrorist, terrorist of history ever. Someone who would dwarf Osama bin Laden. Christopher Columbus. He is the biggest terrorist in, in the history of humanity. This man, according to Howard Zinn, killed over 8 million people in, in the Caribbean. In a in his uh, island called Spaniola, which is now known as Haiti and Re Dom Dominican Republic. Eight million people were killed by Christopher Columbus. And you will find out that the reason this man came to America and discovered America was only and solely to loot and to steal and to rob other nations. That's the only reason Christopher Columbus came with the support of his government in Spain. So, this is a great book that sheds light on the history of America. Go and read it. So when someone talks about Islam and they become so demeaning and tell you Islam did this, tell them go and read your own history. Another book I recommend is Thomas Jefferson's Quran. Thomas Jefferson's Quran. Islam and the Founders by Dennis Spielberg. Dennis Spielberg. This is a very nice read. It tells you that the Quran was one of the documents used by our founding fathers when they were about to author the Constitution. This is documented by a scholar, American Jewish scholar called Dennis Spielberg. Very nice read. Go and read it. Uh, Another book, this is mostly intellectual for those who are more intellectual. It's called What Went Wrong by Bernard Lewis. Bernard Lewis is one of the towering figures for the uh, new cons in the United States. He's a Jew. But in this book, he basically blames not Islam rather than Muslims. I do not agree with everything he says in this book, but in fact, he was somewhat fair with our religion. Uh, I'm sorry, it is by uh, uh, Bernard Lewis. Another book I recommend is written by Sayyid Muhammad Hussain al-Tabatabai, a towering figure in the Shia, uh, you know, hierarchy. He's a philosopher, he is a scholar, and the book is called Islamic Teachings and Overview. It was originally translated from Farsi to English. So it is a translation by Sayyid Muhammad Hussein Taba Taba'i. Yes. Who was the author of the philosopher's book, the great philosopher's book? Yes, I'm, I'm coming to that. If you allow me one second. The author of the philosopher was... Uh, Jeremy Strang, uh, Stangroom, Jeremy Stangroom, S-T-A-N-G-R-O-O-M, and James Garvey, G-A-R-V-E-Y. Okay, listen, brothers, so we're almost done, so just give me a few more minutes, and I will be done with my list. Another book... I believe it's worth reading, is called Shiism in America by Dr. Liaqat Takim, a professor, a Shia professor in Colorado University. Dr. Liaqat Takim, he wrote Shiism in America, and it is published by New York University Press. It's a very nice read. It talks about the history of Shia in America. As a speaker, as a Muslim speaker, you need, to you need to be familiar with the history of Shia Islam in America. I recommend this book. Also, there is another book I recommend. It is called Doctrines of Shia Islam by a well-known scholar in Iran, in Qom. His name is Sheikh Ja'far Ayatollah, Sheikh Ja'far Subhani. Subhani is S U B. H-A-N-H-A-N-I, 
Ayatollah Jafar Subhani, S-O-B-H-A-N-I. Ayatollah Subhani is the prominent scholar in Iran. I, was, I studied with him. He was my teacher. He is one of the greatest, greatest scholars of our time. He wrote this book in Arabic and it was translated to English. He told me, he told me, I wrote this book specifically for non-Muslims. But he wrote it in Arabic because he doesn't read or write in English. And it was translated. Whether the translation is good or not, I don't know. But the book was originally written by Ayatollah. Yes, it is called Doctrines of Shia Islam. Doctrines of Shia Islam, a uh, compendium of imami beliefs and practices. Sheikh Jafar Subhani or Ayatollah Subhani. And another book I recommend, Islamic Laws by Ayatollah Sistani. This also sheds light on Islamic laws. If you want to be more familiar with Islamic laws, read this book, Islamic Laws by Ayatollah Sayyid Ali Sistani. Another book I recommend is by John Renard. John Renard, he has his PhD from Harvard Divinity School. He wrote a nice book called Responses to 101 Questions on Islam. 101 uh, Questions on Islam by John Renard. And that's it with the list and I recommend two more books, two more books, my books. So this is called Handbook of Everyday Islam and it is an answer to 180 questions on variety of Islamic topics I recommend and also American Crescent Eye by Random House I would recommend reading this book. In American, if you read this book, I recommend in page, in page 353, in page, the last chapter, it has a chapter named Americans Ask About Islam, 20 questions. The most frequently qu questions Americans ask about Islam. Read this and study it because I'm telling you this is the accumulation of at least 20 years of experience dealing with non-Muslims. After speaking at over 300 churches, I sort out all the questions I got. Those were the most frequent questions. What are they? So, is Islam peaceful? Did not Islam spread by the sword? What is jihad? What do Muslims consider just war? Why do Muslims not condemn act of terrorism? What is Islam's view on Christians and Jews? Don't today's Muslims hate Jews? Uh, is it true that the Prophet Muhammad killed 700 Jews? Is heaven only for Muslims? 20 questions. The most frequent questions Americans ask about Islam. I recommend uh, reading those two books. Inshallah, next week, I am going to talk about how do I build my presentation? How do I prepare for my presentation? If I am going to make an Islamic presentation on a certain topic, how do I do? I will pick a sample, a topic I will pick, and I practically will show you how do you prepare for a seven minutes lecture or presentation. So that would be the lesson of next week and inshallah starting from the following week we will be starting our practical lessons inshallah